Okay. Got about 20 participants or so now, so uh, we'll make a start. Um, so hello to everybody who has joined us today and thank you all for taking time out on your Friday lunchtime uh, to be with us as we dive into another of our uh, HydroTerra webinar series. Uh, today, we're looking at a 101 on soil moisture monitoring, uh, why and how we monitor soil moisture. So my name is Kyle McLaren. Uh, you should be quite familiar with my voice now if you've been with us before, uh, but I'm the sales manager here at HydroTerra. Uh, it's my pleasure to welcome our guest speaker for today, which is Rob Guy, the sales and marketing manager from Zentech. Uh, Rob is a, hydro, a hydrologist and a soil scientist by trade, uh, having worked in hydrological modeling, agricultural and forestry research. Uh, Rob has managed the sales and marketing at Centec for uh, over 11 years now, uh, with Centec now having distributors in uh, over 40 countries, uh, including ourselves and our relationship with Centec has been uh, well over a decade now. Um, so thanks, Rob, for joining us today. Um, as always, uh, we're also joined by Michelle Canton, our senior uh, monitoring consultant, who's now based in Queensland. Uh, but still continues to provide support for myself on these webinars to ensure everything runs as smoothly as it can. So thanks, Michelle, for joining us uh, as well and your ongoing support throughout all of our webinar series that we do. Uh, our housekeeping for today is just the Q&A chat box uh, on top of your screen. Uh, so as we move through, this presentation, please feel free to write uh, any questions you may have for Rob uh, or myself. And uh, as always, we'll leave a bit of time at the end uh, and we'll tally these all um, to go through them all uh, with you. So our program for today is, uh, I'll hand over to Rob in a, in a second, who will talk a little bit about the history of Centec and how they came to be and where they are now. Uh, we'll talk a little bit about why it's important to monitor soil moisture uh, and what this soil moisture data can tell us. I think you'll be pleasantly surprised by the amount of data and information that can be uh, from this, as I certainly was when I first heard of these applications. Uh, Rob will also talk about how we go about uh, the monitoring and where we think the technology might be best situated. Uh, and finally, a bit of the product overview of the Sentech probes and the tools available in order for us to obtain this data, uh, as well as the, as, as I mentioned, the Q&A at the end there. Uh, but without further ado, I'd like to hand uh, this over to Rob. So thanks very much, Rob. Um, thank you, Carl, and good, um, good afternoon, I guess, everybody, unless you're in WA, good morning. Um, okay, just on, as Carl was saying, starting off with the history of where we sit, and this is Peter Bust, who's the founder of, of Centec um, Company back 30 years ago this month, actually. So we just had our um, 30th anniversary on the 12th of April. Um, so founded in 1991, 12th of April. And uh, this is Peter with some of the first prototypes. And really a brief history of it is that um, he was working out as an agronomist on neutron probes and really wanted to find a better way to do it. And he was working with all sorts of different ideas. And he just happened to meet up with, a, um, with Rick Gatto who was who had been working for British Aerospace. And Rick suggested, why don't we do this electronically? And it had just coincided with a real time of the advent of development of some of the microprocessors that allowed them to, to, to adopt and find chips that allowed them to measure at very, very high frequencies, and, but using very low ampage draw and uh, measure soil moisture that, that way. And it took them a couple of years to develop the, the sensors and the frequency in order to measure at the right level without any interference. But they ended up with a highly scientific product with high resolution, which I'll cover later. And this is really one of the first prototypes. It doesn't look like that, anything like that now, but it's still those two brass capacitance rings um, using dielectric, uh, using the dielectric contents, con constant of the soil and the change of it, of, of the water in the soil and the salt is another application. And this was the first one run with car batteries and in the field and lunch boxes and all sorts of things. But this was the first prototype that was then shared with growers 
over a couple of year period until the adoption and the insights that they were getting were just so tremendous that uh, that they said, we've got to start a company. And that was the dawn of Centec. And it's really grown and grown from there. And as Carl was saying, we now got offices in the US and in Europe, and we're just expanding and our sales and and reach is just going, you know, it's, it's we're really at that exponential stage of growth, which is so great to see, not only with researchers, environmental monitoring, but also importantly in commercial agriculture. So we're a scientific grade measurement company, censoring company, but our main sales are actually into commercial agriculture. And I'll cover some of that later on, um, and, or it will come apparent. Okay, next slide. Okay, and this is really some of that first applications. These are really old pictures, but, but because Peter came from that scientific agron agronomic background, he wanted everything validated with research papers, soil science journal, all these type of things, independent validation. And this is some work that was done in California where the probes were actually installed in lysimeters. So matching the actual measurement of the probe, the calibration of the probe was really important in order to not only be doing an electronic measurement, but translating that electronic measurement into volumetric iron content with calibration equations. And this is part of that work. Uh, next slide. And this is the key team, um, Pulteney and Star, which, which produced some of that really early, early work in the early 90s, I think 1995 paper. Um, that was one of the keystones of, um, of Centec's credibility going into the market, enabling us to sell to researchers and then really just reference these independent papers that came out to say, this technology really works and it is scientifically valid and you can use it in your research. Uh, next slide. And this is really the early calibration equations that came out and is the foundation for the calibration equations in the Enviroscan probe which we'll cover later. And if you have a look at this, the frequency or, or the relative frequency on the Y axis and the volumetric soil moisture on the X axis. And if you see that little picture on the bottom left, you know, that represents the calibration site. One picture of a calibration site where various probes were installed um, at multiple depths and then ranges of water contents, which are reflected on that graph were from very dry all the way through to, to moist were, were simulated in different plots. And then gravimetric sampling, as you can see in the top right with a little ring there, gravimetric sampling was taken, which is the only standard for volumetric moisture. And then that was compared with that frequency at the time of sampling. And then obviously go to the oven way before in the oven, way after in the oven, you know, the volume of the soil and you can, and you know, that, so you could calculate the bulk density and then calculate your volumetric soil content. And they ended up with this great relationship by combining a number of studies together, which included work in the US and DPI and CIRO across a range of soils to produce a really robust um, calibration equation that really worked well across all uh, across a range of soil types and that default calibration equation is then written into the probe so that when the probe takes that um, that ionic measurement based on the dielectric of the soil water it can be translated instantly by the board for you into a volumetric soil water content but I'll show you later on that you can actually change this so if you have a specific soil that doesn't really fit in or you want to, to change it we have a whole library of calibration equations and even other ways of adjusting the data to match your specific site as well as the facility for you to derive your own calibration equation and use that so um, that's really great and then just that bottom right graph showing that Beltsville California, Australia, a whole lot of combined data. They really fitted so well together with a great R squared value. So we're very, they were very, very happy at the time to be able to launch this as, as a, not only a scientifically valid, but highly practical tool that gave volumetric soil water content. Next slide, Carl. So what does that enable us to do? Okay, so the first insight is this is, one of the graph, this is a graph of soil moisture data. And it just shows some of the commonly measured parameters that traditionally one would have to get from by doing a whole lot of laboratory work and determining field capacities and wilting points and onset of wilting and plant available water and readily available water, all these things that traditionally we go and measure. And of course, that's the way to valid, do it validly. 
in, in the laboratory through um, suction plates and measurements, whereas the probe actually tells us. So provided you've got a calibrated probe that matches that soil type, you can actually use your probe to determine, this is the first of the insights, your actual soil water property. So on the x-axis, you have time, okay? And on the y-axis is the soil water content. Now this particular graph is what we call a summed graph. So it's adding up all the sensors in the profile. So our sensors can measure every 10 centimeters down a profile, all the way down. You'll see we've got some really deep ones later on. Um, but if you add up all the sensors in the profile, you can make a summed graph. Now the color coding on this is very simple. Blue means too much water, red means too little water, and green means you got it. Okay, so this picture here is really showing how if you're starting from the left before the 4th of February, there's some irrigation or rain came in. And initially, we over the threshold. And the reason we know we over the threshold from a pattern point of view is that we're using our plant as the actual sensor. So the extraction pattern of the plant as it draws water is actually telling us about the soil properties in the soil and how the plant is reacting to them, which is all about what these stress points are. So you can see initially, it's they irrigated in there and then there are these little small steps and those steps, if you're not familiar with that, are the day night steps. So we got night time, day time, night time, day time. So at night, it's, it's um, horizontal. In the daytime, it's, ver it's vertical. And the size of those steps um, reflects the evapotranspiration of the plant. Now, what we've determined and all these by looking at these graphs and saying, what on earth does all this mean? Is that when you've got a small step, the plant is not transpiring for some reason. And, so, and the reflection of the non-transpiration is that you're not getting that change in moisture content to the same degree. So initially in that blue zone, we're talking about very small steps because we're actually short of air. So the plant's got an aeration problem and that's also causing stomata to close down, affecting photosynthesis. And then as it dries down and you actually get to that field capacity, which is defined as that real nice balance of air and water after soils drain to a point of matrix potential out of equaling your gravity pull, we've got that really nice steps that are day and night, day and night, day and night, pulling down at a maximum pull until you get to a point where suddenly the plant cannot pull. It's pulling at different levels all the way through the profile as the water is available, satisfying evaporative demand. And then it gets to a point where it can't pull anymore and it starts slowing down and you're starting to lose yield at that time or gain quality, which we'll gain, cover later. And then you move to a point where you're obviously going to a permanent wilting point position. So, wow, that only show, that shows you your field capacity can show you your saturation point for your soil, can show you your onset of wilting, which is like that F factor, which is all we say, oh, well, the F factor of a cactus is a lot higher than an X factor for a lettuce. And all this is written in textbooks and we, we do estimates based on rainfall. You can just observe it by using your probe. So in this, there's your onset of stress is your F factor. And then you're moving down to your actual permanent wilting point of your, of your soil. So, and then from that, Practically, from a farming point of view, not only do you know your plant available water, which is all the water available to the plant, sometimes readily, sometimes not, but you can define the green zone that is your readily plant available water content, which in the 101 of irrigation management is keep it in the green. You let the plant tell you what's happening and keep him healthy or her and keep her, he, her or him in the green and you go for your maximum yield and water efficiency at that level. Okay, next slide. Okay, and how do we know, oops, how do we know how well that works? And this is just to illustrate that. If we look, don't worry about the blue graph for now, that is really just a, a bar graph reflecting the line graph below. So the, just to exactly the same, those steps are reflected in the blue graph. The next graph down is your ET, measured by your weather station, so your evaporative demand. So just a simple example from real data showing the, day, the, the ET rising, rising, rising. So day one at 6.6, .6, day two at seven, day three at seven, day four, 7.6, .6, day five, 7.6. .6. And you can see how that reflects really well in the pattern of the green lines below. So you can see that increase in evaporation uh, extraction of the plant based on the ET. So 
it's in a perfect zone for the for the in terms of soil water content between field capacity and wilting point for the plant to be operating maximum and depending on the et it's it's actually reflecting the amount of evaporation taken on that day okay so um that's really kind of neat to see <laughs> okay next slide Okay, then what do we do from a practical point of view? When you're irrigating, all the graphs I've shown you up to now have been what we call the summed graph, okay? Which is what I said before. It's the addition of all the sensors in the profile, giving us the overall health of our entire root zone. But that's not the full picture. What one has to understand is we have to understand each layer of the soil, okay? So it's really important. We want to know where did the water go? How much water is at each level? Did we waste water? Um, is the plant, where's the plant drawing from? How much is it drawing from each layer? How dense are the roots? You know, all these things that again, we used to guess or used to use best scientific research knowledge, digging roots and measuring them. Again, we can just observe the data and we can determine it. So each of those line graphs there from the red, blue, black, pink down to the green, they all different layers in the soil. So the, the top one is near the surface, 10, 20, 30, 40, 50 centimeter, for example, that would be um, that would be the root. So each of those graphs is on exactly the same scale, but we stack, we call a stack graph. So we stack them one above the other. So it's like looking at your soil profile from the side and looking how each layer is working with again your time on the x-axis. So you can see in the beginning, lots of irrigations. And you can see those irrigations are not ref not going to where you have roots. Because if you look at the shape of each graph, you can see if they've got steps or not. And if it doesn't have steps, the roots aren't there. Okay. And so initially, there's a lot of irrigation going down all the way down to that green zone without there being roots there. It doesn't mean it's necessarily a bad thing because this also comes into irrigation scheduling. Later on in the season, you might not even have enough water application rate to supply your roots. So you want to fill your whole reservoir up. You want to fill your profile up even below the root zone so that later on when your evaporative demand is crazy, you can actually mine that water from the bottom because you just can't supply at the rate that's required. And that's very common. So there's a lot of, sometimes it, it can be an over irrigation and you've wasted water and fertilizer. Sometimes it's good management. And that depends on what, how, what your crop is, what your planning is. So there's a lot of interaction needed between the agronomists. Uh, really, you need good agronomists and they can use this data and really add value to, to the irrigation system. And as you see, it's not only about yield and water efficiency, it's about quality too. And we'll get to that. Um, okay, so... And you can see after a little while at that first little blue arrow, the roots have now developed at that third level. So we now know we've got roots there. We can happily keep replenishing that area. And as we go on in time, you can see the steps get bigger and bigger at each of those layers that develops roots. And that is a measurement of the root development at that site. And interestingly enough, from a research point of view, we sell a lot of probes to genetic um, breeders because instead of having to go and measure where the roots are and prove where your roots are, they actually use the probes to track their roots. So they put arrays of probes, not only one probe in a profile, but multiple probes all the way around a plant. And by using wetting and drying cycles to various times in the season, they're actually able to determine the capacity for each layer to withdraw water. And so quantify using the soil water extraction as a surrogate to quantify the actual root density and a whole array in a three-dimensional plot around a plant. So that's fantastic work. And we've had, uh, oh, and then people do it for all sorts of reasons, not only genetics, you might have a soil ameliorant. You want to test different tillage methods to see how wide your soils go sideways, whether you've got compaction problems. Uh, so agronomists also use it as a problem solving tool. And so we introduce what we call it the Centec toolkit. And uh, so you use multiple probes and put them out in arrays setting out from the plant and so you can actually solve a problem and see where's my water going where isn't it going are my roots getting there am i wasting water down in the furrow and not enough getting into the mound when you're growing potatoes etc that the opportunities are endless okay thank you next slide another thing that people get out of it is the effective rainfall it's one thing having a rain gauge which is obviously a great tool and we love rain gauges in conjunction with what we measure Actually, what you're interested in from a agriculture or even resource or research, what is actually going into the soil? 
So because the sensors actually measure at 10 centimeter depth, you know, naught to 10 centimeter depth, you're not measuring what's lying in puddles on the soil or getting intercepted by the plants and evaporating. You're actually measuring the amount that went into the soil. And in this particular case, okay, the irrigations were in pink on that bar graph at the top and the rainfall in blue. You can actually see by looking at that thing with all the question marks there, that five millimeters of rain had little impact. So really, it's a bit like when you're trying to measure your, how much water you can capture in your rainwater tank off your roof. Traditionally, you just disregard first two millimeters. And this is similar, but you can, you can actually quantify it for your soil. If you have a rain gauge, or you know exactly how much actually went into your soil. It's, you know, it's academic interest to know what fell, but what you really want to know is what is in my soil for my plants to use. Okay, next question. Next, next slide. And a practical application of this is an example under a center pivot where a person had so many problems. He really had problems and he was battling to meet the demand. He didn't build his reservoir up and up enough at the bottom of the profile, like we were talking about earlier. And he just couldn't get the water in. And he was putting his pivot on faster and faster and faster trying to get the water in. But as we saw in the last slide, your efficiency goes down because every pivot application loses water to interception and puddling on the surface and evaporation. So you had to be counterintuitive and actually slow his pivot down, get the water into the soil so that he could then get to the point of recovery. And you can see how it was only on about the 14th of April there that he's actually managed to penetrate in and after that period of stress to actually start that green level just starting to rise and the next level starting to rise. And you can see this more clearly on the next slide, which is the same data observed with the sun graph. So next slide, please. Um, okay, and this is the same data, that same little period is a box there. Um, and this is a sun graph where we added them all together. So you see initially wildly going with lots of pivot speed, just the, but he can't keep up. The soil moisture is just going down, down, down. He loses that lots of money in that period just before the 7th of April to about the 14th of April. And believe me, that is a lot of money. Every day it costs you money. And, um, and then he managed to slow his pivot down and he built up his soil moisture. And from then on, he was able to maintain it again. And uh, so they're yeah, very practical um, uh, application of just knowing where your water is and, and tying it in with your agronomic practices. Looking back at your data, reflecting, what am I doing wrong? Must I change my tillage? Must I change my soil moisture? Should I mulch this season? All these questions and answers you can get and the probes just sort out that black box under the ground that you really don't know what's happening. And those dynamics are really important. It's one thing to go out in the soil and take a sample and feel it, but by having the probe measuring it constantly for you, they're telling you all sorts of things that are happening. Okay, next next slide. Again, water tables. Ooh, lots of problems with that. Okay, so, so what happens is after over time, you can develop a water table. So you over irrigate and you develop a water table. Now water tables can, are really bad news. Obviously not only are you wasting your water and your fertilizer, but you're bringing up all those salts from the bottom and bringing them into your profile, which can really destroy your soil. Okay, if for future years, you just can salinize your soil with over irrigation, big, big challenge. And of course, more practically from season to season, you get all sorts of phytophoras and root diseases by sitting in water logging in the soil. Now, again, as we saw from that first slide, as soon as a layer starts flatlining, and if you have a look at the number, if you can just see that on the left in that bottom pain, it says 45.9%. So I know that that is not stress. If it was down at 12, I would know that it's flatlined because of stress. But I know it's 45.9, okay, which is definitely a saturated soil. So you use the numbers as well as the pattern of the graph to determine what's going on. And why, wow, gosh, has, have you got a, a water table forming there? Then after a while, either it was rain or we stopped irrigating or something and it drew all the way down again and then the bad practices started all over again and he over irrigated with look definitely looks like irrigations you can actually see the difference between irrigation and rain irrigation is a sharp curve going up you get a sharp spike because it's applied and stopped rain tends to drift in and out as you know hard and soft so you get a bit more of a wavy increase so those are irrigations and he's over irrigating, causing water tables and various times. But hopefully after October in that example, 
he improved his life and, and went on. If you have a look, this date is really old. This is from 1995. So this is data from the first year of applications. And so this is these, these insights have been available. Okay, next slide. Okay, just from a final example here, this is, and there's lots more, um, they're, they're soil water dynamics. Um, and some of these are from an environmental point of view is like, this is a particular problem that one client had. They needed to prove to the EPA, according to their license, that they weren't leaching this contaminated water that they were dosing and you know, putting lots of calcium in to prevent a double layer effect on the, nut, on the lots of sodium in the soil, but they still had to prove that they weren't leaching any of this. And a certain, well, I think above 2.5% above water application rate was allowed into the root zone. So what they had to do is make sure that they irrigating, and if they're anticipating rain, you irrigate to a deficit so that the soil can still buffer and absorb the rain and you're not washing down into down into the groundwater, but they had one sensor situated below at the bottom of the root zone. And so what we, in our software, you have the facility to actually plot that as not only a bar graph, I mean, as a line graph, but also as a bar graph. And in this case, showing only the negative. So we're not plotting the positive where the graph goes up and the water goes in, we're only plotting extraction. And that extraction in this particular case shows the amount of water leaching below the profile. And so by putting a ruler at each end, we can quantify it and say, oh, okay, 41.84 millimeters of water multiplied by the area of your land is the volume of water that leached below your root zone and potentially down into the groundwater eventually of this water that's not very nice, but it might meet your EPA requirements or not, or you must improve your irrigation system or whatever it is. But there's a lot of insights that you can get from this and water balance calculations. And yeah, no, great. You know, as you can lose your imagination, <laughs> it goes on and on. Okay, next slide. Next slide. Okay, this one is, is a fantastic study and it was almost a mistake for it to get the really nice information that we, we got out of it. Um, on the right hand side, you can see a catchment, which is in, um, this is on the east coast of the United States. There's a catchment over there with a whole, just happened to have a range of soil types. And because what the, it was a USDA, uh, there were nine research organizations, USDA, the US Department of Agriculture, NASA was involved. It was all about satellite tracking and looking at subsurface water flow and everything. And they put in, I think a total of 48 probes down to depth with, you know, quite a lot, quite, quite deep as well. And they put every, they sighted the probe so that every change of soil type had a probe that represented that soil type. And then they monitored it for three seasons and they got what they wanted out of it. And then Peter, our founder said, what about this? Go to the next slide. Okay, what he did is he identified the amounts of time and he counted the number of days that each probe spent in either the blue zone or the red zone and called those stress zones. So every day that the soil moisture content wasn't in that optimum green zone, he counted as a stress day. And then they harvested the corn over three years around each probe and worked out what the yield was. And it's in bushels on the left-hand side, okay, on the y-axis in bushels because it's the US. And then they plotted the number of stress days. And it came out with really groundbreaking insights is you could actually start to quantify what every day of mismanagement actually costs you in terms of money and corn by looking at those three seasons, which happened to be a wet season, a medium season, and a dry season, which worked out really well plotted the graph, great relationship. And you can see that, for example, in this particular case, a 15 days of not getting your irrigation right actually cost you 50% of your potential yield on that site for not getting your water right. But even a few days, even one or two days, costs you a significant amount of y-axis. Agricultural you have, say, it costs you 100 bushels per acre to grow your crop. That's your cost. So your profit is, for example, potentially up to 60 bushels. Okay. Now, if you even do it badly for two or three days, you might lose 20 bushels. So you might have only lost, say, whatever that is, you know, 8% of your yield. 
but you've lost 33% of your profit, okay? Because it costs you 100 bushels just to pay for the crop. And every, this is applicable to whatever you're talking about, potatoes, whatever it is. And when I get to the data, which I will do in a minute, some live data um, on our Euromax live platform, which is all the software, which is practically used from a research and a commercial uh, point of view, I will show you, and it's an example in McLaren Vale from um, Integrated Precision Viticulture who operates in that region, um, that, the, um, that the quality is really important. So sometimes you not only want to keep it in the green, sometimes you ride that red line in order to induce different qualities. And again, those qualities are not only about, um, about grapes. They can be anything. They can be avocados. They can be nuts. They can be wheat. That could be anything where you're trying to control proteins or sucrose or the size, even sugarcane. Um, you, there are certain times when you actually don't want to overwater the crop because they can't get the right balance of nutrients or size. Sometimes a supermarket just pays you more or a potato chipping machine wants a higher percentage of a particular size crop. And that's getting on to 102, 103 honors. Okay, once you can start doing that. So without further ado, um, I can shift over and, and, and get on to, to that soon. So next slide. Oh, sorry, I won't get onto that. Oh, sorry, I've got to get onto the products. I'm a bit running behind time. Um, so this is the first one, the Enviroscan. Click on sensor, still widely used, measuring every 10 centimeters into the soil, particularly deep crops. And you can either send it by telemetry or you can manually download the data. Next slide. Okay, then we, of course, developed the TriScan data, which allows us to, to use multiple a second frequency to also get an indication of salinity in the soil. So we could also do that at every depth. Okay, next slide. And, of course, these ones can go really deep. So this is a 50-meter 50, 50 probe, for example, that goes really, really deep in the botanical gardens and in, in Melbourne. And this is an example of, of installing that. And we've got all sorts of environmental and research and hydrological studies that measure all the way down through the Vado zone. Next slide. Okay, now final production that we a recent product is the drill and drop. So again, the drill and drop can plug into all sorts of telemetry, be it our own or third party telemetry. But what's clever about it is that it's a fully encapsulated probe so that there's no chance of water getting in. And the very clever part of it is that it's actually a tapered probe. Okay, so the probe is actually tapered and uh, we can send the video of, uh, of it being installed later on, but the, it's a tapered probe. So you drill a hole that's also tapered. Okay, very importantly tapered. So it's slightly thicker at the top than it is at the bottom. It tapers by one millimeter per foot. You drill that hole and then you can push that, that probe into the soil and wedge it into shape. And that gives a tight fit, as you can see, where we've cut away the profile here. And you measure directly into the profile without any air gaps and, importantly, no disturbance of the soil. So the dynamics that you're measuring at each level, the field capacity, the wilting point, is specific to that. We do not use any slurry, if possible. And then just on the right-hand side, we also have a Bluetooth option where the data is collected and logged on the probe. And you can come and collect it with your phone. And you can collect multiple data from multiple probes on your phone. And that's proven to be really popular with researchers with lots of little plots. They don't have to have any telemetry on that. And uh, they can just use their telephone and it goes straight to the software from there. Nurseries as well, use that and vegetable crops where you have lots and lots of changeover and you need to pull in and out the probes, no cables, no hassle. Okay, probably just go to the next slide, Carl. And just to show you the importance of the um, undisturbed installation, um, the top graph is a proper installation and the bottom graph is a slurry installation where you've actually mixed up soil, mixed up soil and water, you've made a sloppy mixture and you've pushed the sensor down. Not only does that mean that you can't use that data for a long time before, before it's stabilized, it also means that the data is not real. The infiltration rate's not real. You've messed up the structure, the texture, the textual changes, all those dynamics of field capacity and wilting point, which are individual to each horizon, have all been mixed up into one slushy thing. So it's not representative of the soil. So really important. We really advocate a direct install. And what's great about it is that a direct install is so fast. You don't have to carry buckets of water, sieve soil, mix it all up. You just go in, drill the hole, take it out literally in as easy soil it can be in minutes 
We've installed 72 once in Florida. It was a sandy site, but we did it in one day in a trial. Put in, the, put in drilling the hole, literally 30 seconds in the sand. Not always. Sometimes it takes us quite a few minutes if it's a clay and it's deep. Um, and then you've created that slightly tapered hole. You wedge the, the probe in, wedge it in, push it in tight against the side. It's installed. And then extraction is also easy if you have to extract it because you just break the seal. And then because of the taper, it pulls out easily. You don't have to pull, 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 pull all the way down. Okay, next slide. Okay, and I'll switch to the Aramax Live um, presentation. So I'm going to share my screen now. Okay, and if you can see my screen now, this is a typical dealer um, site, and this is in McLarenville, as I said, uh, kindly shared by IPV there. They have got hundreds down in the site there. And this is why I chose these examples and um, got permission from George to do it, is that we have, um, is that they're great users in the Shiraz of deliberately stressing the plant. So without further ado, I'll show you some of the data. So this is five, this particular one, the map shows you the percentage. So this is showing it's in the green. All these ones are in the green. These ones are in the yellow zone, which means you can also define a yellow zone between the green and the red to warn you that they're in the yellow zone, but actually they're deliberately in the yellow zone as I'll click. So if you want to have a look at your data, a grower could, for example, just log into this site. He sees all his probes. You can quickly look and say, okay, those ones are in the green. That's all fine. Oh, this one's in the yellow. There's only 5% left. Let me click on it. A little mini graph comes up and he clicks on that graph. It actually loads it. And now you can see this case, both of the types of graphs together. The top graph showing each layer and the bottom one showing the sum of each layer. And you can see how it drew down at this case. And so very importantly, pre verizon here in the August to October period, you don't want any stress on this plant. If the berries are forming, you don't want to mess up your cell division. Everything must be good. Okay. Then the what he does, he drew, brings the soil moisture down into that period between December and April when he's actually the berries are ripening now. And you want to get that strong Shiraz flavor. So you, but you don't want to lose yield. So you're riding in that yellow zone. And he seems to be improving. Like that year, he kind of got it. This year, he's being a little bit more adventurous and stressing a little bit more because he's going for maybe a little bit higher quality. He probably got himself up a grade in premium by through that last summer season. This summer season, he's saying, okay, I can probably take a little bit further. And you know, his, his winemaker is saying, I need something of more actina mass and activity, more, um, more hormones that are changing the, the flavor of the wine to get up to a $50 bottle. And um, he's riding that line. And, and that's, so that's an example of a typical Shiraz, what we call regulated deficit irrigation management. Um, and of course, the grower can do what he likes. You can zoom in. If I just click on the graph, it zooms in on a period. Um, you can put predictors that tell you about when you must next irrigate. And there are all sorts of other functions. We can place rulers like we saw before on the graph. I want to actually see what my moisture content is there. Just after I irrigate it, I put a ruler there and it'll tell me my moisture content at that site. Um, and what else do I want to do? I can put comments on. So I can put comments on the graph so I can communicate with my grower or my grower can communicate with me. Tell them, no, you irrigated too much. Cut down your irrigation. And those comments can be positioned anywhere on the graph. You can change the colors thresholds there. You can have different growth stages. So different periods of time, you might want to guide them to be planting, to be irrigating at different times. And importantly, as I said before, you can add pain. So if you've got a weather station or other data, you can actually bring it in above or below that. You can copy panes and put them in with other graphs. And importantly, as I mentioned before, you can also do data adjustments. So for example, on this one, you might say, ah, I'm not really happy with that. I, want, I don't think that reflects my field properly. I want to try another calibration equation. You can try it. And particularly sometimes in very heavy clays or light sands, the default might not work perfectly for what you want. And you try it out. I'm not going to do it because I don't want to mess up with George's data. Yeah. Okay. Um, so yeah, and so I just that's a brief overview of what you can do, but practically used in research, great insights, environmental applications for policy, for uh, meeting legislative requirements, and 
obviously widely, widely in commercial, in, in commercial irrigated agriculture, but actually increasingly even dry land too, to making decisions on, on you know, whether you put a top dressing on or doing infield trials. And there's a lot of that going on too. So I was just on the Air Peninsula. There are probably about 60, 70 probes there alone on this kind of thing. So yeah, so lots and lots of insight. Um, and that's it for me. Thank you very much. Okay, thanks, Rob. I'll just go back to our presentation here and uh, we'll open it up uh, for any questions that, um, that you might have regarding that. Um, feel free to type in the Q&A box. Um, we had a couple of questions come through uh, already um, prior to this um, webinar. So we might start off with those and give some people some time if they'd wish to uh, type anything uh, that they'd like to ask. So uh, the first question, Rob, was uh, asked if there was any, is, is there any technology available to, to undertake soil moisture reading without direct contact with the soil? Um, no, we require, don't, you, you have to have direct contact. And as I said, um, we, have, uh, we have an installation method, which we really spent a lot of time on and patents on in order to make sure that we could drill a hole and both the EnviroScan and the drill and drop, which is easier to do, um, to ensure using that taper or by drilling through the tube, which is a bit more complicated method on the EnviroScan, that we have an undisturbed installation with the, with the, the, with the plastics on the outside of the actual probe in direct contact with the soil so that you can measure because the electric field has to pass through the plastic into the soil and you do need direct contact. We do not have a, an, an indirect contact method of, of doing that at all. Um, you need direct contact in order for the waves to work. Yep. Okay, yep. Um, another one was uh, technology available which can produce uh, instant reading of soil moisture uh, and be linked to a comms unit for remote relay. Yep, absolutely. So we have so many options on that. We have, um, and I didn't really get into all the ways the data can be transmitted, but we have logging probes um, where obviously we always translate to soil moisture content on the probe using the calibration equation, which is written into the circuit board. Um, then we have various options on some of our own Centec solutions, which can be provided through dealers Hydroterra. They, they, that will, will in itself wake up a modem um, and transmit the data and that you can set to how often you want. So most commonly in agriculture, people don't need the data instantly. They would, um, you know, they're looking a few times a day. So they might log a few readings before they activate them, before they program, it's all pre-programmed. The probe is activated to open the modem, say after every three readings, open the modem, transmit the data to live where we saw it on that graph example. Um, Otherwise, but you can do that. You, could, you can read as often as you like and transmit as often as you like. Um, that's up to you and up to your data plan. Um, that's really just a practical amount of data you want and how often you want it is purely up to the user to send. Um, and that can be programmed. Secondly, we also have third party uh, compatible probes. So we, the probes can be Modbus or um, SDR12, which plug into a huge range of loggers and controllers and anything. And of course, they can be programmed to read instantly and send the data, display the data, operate control systems, whatever you want. So that's so we completely compatible with a whole range of other people, whether it be, you know, radio networks, controllers, LORAs, other um, cellular satellite telemetry solutions, it's, it's, it's can be done. And, you know, and of course, the final way is the manual upload, which I mentioned with the Bluetooth probe again, data you can stand there and have a probe uploading that a phone upload so in a greenhouse you could potentially have that setting and we haven't had anyone do it yet but i did speak to the engineers it is possible for it to set on auto upload on a phone so if you could have your phone really well a little bit kind of a hack method um, yep. 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 And I suppose, uh, yeah, the the integration piece of those sensors into uh, into third party systems is something that, uh, um, as well as and uh, if.
from uh, Robert. Uh, have you noticed temperature moisture data? If so, ah, thank you for that question. That's uh, I should have mentioned that actually. Our drill and drop probes they always measure um, moisture and temperature. Okay, and optionally salinity. So we have two types: either the moisture probe, which measures moisture and temperature, or moisture, temperature, and salinity on the TriScan probe. Now we have a temperature correction factor built in, like any electronic equipment, be it an EC meter or whatever. They've all got little temperature things in there because the electronics heats up, the soil heats up, and you have to compensate for that. So we do have a a, um, a compensation built in through the um, by using the, the actual temperature, which is also measured in the probe. So not only do you get soil temperature, but you also it's also used as a temperature compensation to deal with that. And sometimes there are circumstances, you've got funny soils, there's an infinite number of soils out there where that doesn't quite work and you're still seeing a temperature effect. Well, you can actually calibrate it for that soil. And you can either do it with the way I was showing you the change in the calibration equation, can make an adjustment there at the post-processing stage, or you can actually do it in the probe. So each probe can actually, you can log into the probe before you set it up and change what we call the D coefficient. So the ABC coefficients are that curve that's translating scale frequency into moisture. The D factor is the temperature compensation. We have a default one in there, but that's also manually adjustable if you want to go to um, you know, the process of, of doing it for your specific soil. Thank you. Yep. Yep. Yeah, excellent. Um, we just have another one here from uh, Kel Baldock. Um, thanks for joining us, Kel. Uh, in the deeper profiles discussed, uh, has the installation of probes been preceded by soil profile sampling and physical moisture analysis of profile layers? Uh, interest is in profiles five to eight metres deep in forest areas. Um, yes, so that would be, we would, you know, that would be fantastic if people do that. Um, you know, we, we don't, there'd be a huge range of research um, people that have done it. A lot of time, I mean, we would certainly encourage that for them to actually take um, proper core samples while they're doing the, um, the drilling of the hole. Um, we'd have to look through papers, to be honest. I can make a note of that and see, you know, through discussion papers and, you know, you can just Google Centec deep soil moisture monitoring and uh, see who's actually taken samples uh, we certainly done it for a couple of private jobs. They're probably not going to have published that data because a lot of the people that do environmental work, mining companies and people disposing of the water, they don't make that data publicly available. But if it's a, if it's a researcher that's published it, um, there would certainly be that data of, um, you know, actually determining in the lab the, the data and then they can cross-correlate and calibrate the probe themselves. And that's certainly been done by people, but I'd have to find the exact papers. Yep. Thanks for that. Um, any other questions that anybody wishes to ask? Yeah, with those, I don't see uh, any more coming through, um, but thank you to those that have uh, provided the questions through. Um, if there's uh, no, further, no further questions, we might, um, we might wrap that up there. Uh, so once again, thanks thanks for taking uh, the time out today, and also a big thank you to Rob uh, for for your insight on the on the soil moisture monitoring there and uh, view from from Centec. Uh, so thanks a lot, Rob, for that. Um, if you wish to have any more questions that uh, you might think of after the fact, uh, be sure to uh, send me an email here in the details uh, provided on the screen. And uh, if there's something specific uh, in terms of, uh, of research or, or a more technical aspect, uh, I can certainly um, provide through Rob's uh, details also. Um, so uh, without further ado, thank you very much, uh, everybody, and uh, have a great day. And we really appreciate your time here today. So thanks, Rob, for joining us. Thank you.